always a pleasure to come back to Rochester and to meet friends here. The title uh, of these talks that I give here are set by the local organizations. Very often they don't tell me what the title is. I have to find out by strange means, asking here and there, then they try to mislead me. When I heard about the title a little while ago, I thought they wanted me to talk about a bird sanctuary. <laughs> and I don't know too much about birds, except the story of the bird which I told you. The few bird sanctuaries I have seen are really beautiful. One is a bird sanctuary in Florida, which is now called the Sunken Garden. Anybody seen it? The Sunken Garden, and it used to be called the Parrot Jungle. I visited that garden way back in the 60s during my stay in Boston, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, while at school. And a friend of mine drove me all the way along the East Coast through many states and we reached Florida and went to the Parrot Jungle. And we saw some of the most beautiful birds, most beautiful parrots, lovely colors, large parakeets and cockatoos and all kinds of interesting birds doing strange things. They were trained to do various things. I saw a parrot riding a bicycle. I'd never seen that before. I saw one that was adding 2 plus 2 is 4 and giving the right answer. If the trainer said 2 plus 2 is 5, the parrot would shake its head no. Only when the correct answer was written, the parrot would say yes. I had never met such intelligent parrots anywhere in the world. There was a little alleyway going along the bushes and some of these parrots were left in the wild just to sit on any branch of any tree. And they were specially trained because as you passed by that shrub or the tree or bush, the parrots would sneak in, sneak his face out and say, what's the hurry? What's your name? What's the hurry? Now, they all had that a parroty, squawky voice. What's the honey? You know how parrots speak. <laughs> Except one parrot, and I can never forget this experience. Except one parrot who spoke exactly like a human voice. I couldn't believe it. The parrot said, what's your hurry? I said, what? That's a parrot or somebody hiding behind. Is it a hidden tape recorder? It was actually the parrot. When I saw that parrot, I was walking ahead of the rest of the party. We were about 20 people. And I was walking a little fast and uh, accosted this parrot before them. So I said, there is no hurry. That's something I talked as if I, I was really supposed to respond. And the parrot began to laugh. I have never seen a laughing parrot. The parrot laughed so loudly, I began to laugh. And I had to laugh so boisterously. I threw my head up laughing. And the parrot threw his head up laughing. That was the point when the rest of the party came and saw us doing this. <laughs> they couldn't believe this was possible. They got, at least one got a definite impression, and then the others shared it, that this fellow Ishwar Puri must have been a parrot in a past life. <laughs> when they questioned me, do you think you were a parrot in a past life? I said, why past life? Even this life. They didn't understand what I was trying to say. They thought, maybe I'm a parrot dressed up like a human being. With the result, they thought I must be missing my relatives for that Christmas. I got parrot pictures, uh, par stuffed parrots, and one live parrot in a cage as a Christmas gift. They thought I must be missing my relatives. That was a strange visit to a bird sanctuary. And the birds there were flying freely, enjoying themselves, laughing, joking, as I've never seen anywhere else. The other day, many years later, I was given a gift at one of the functions we had in Mequon, Wisconsin, a certificate awarded to me for my excellence in my work. The certificate is still there. I think Clarence might be having. The certificate was for my excellence as a parent. Is that true? So you see how I'm recognized so easily. So when they said, I'm going to speak about bird sanctuaries, I knew that I was a qualified speaker for that. But here Gela comes up 
and says, not the bird sanctuary, it's the inner sanctuary. And I am still walking up and wondering, what's the difference? Sanctuary is a sanctuary, wherever it is. If you can enter a park, a forest, a jungle, a quiet place, a place full of nature, environmentally sound, if you can go into a place and enjoy bliss and happiness and sing freely and fly freely, it must be a great sanctuary. And do we know any such place? I went to the same parrot jungle now in the sunken garden, people taking pictures, reporters drawing things, politicians addressing the woods. I was surprised that we try to destroy the peace of every sanctuary we know. You go to all the other peaceful places, the beaches have been destroyed, the jungles have been totally cut off trees, denuded of trees, the rivers are going bad. We don't have too many places where we can say this is a good sanctuary for us to have peace. There used to be the old monks going into monasteries, which they used to call their sanctuaries. The monastery was a great sanctuary because there they could hide themselves and they could hear nothing. It was so quiet. When they ate, they ate quietly. Have you ever been to a Buddhist monastery? Anybody? Okay, so you would understand what I am saying. Because I visited a large number of Buddhist monasteries. Some of the largest monasteries in the world. I visited those in the Himalayas. I visited those elsewhere. They wear those very soft, gentle clothes. Those robes which can rustle around just like the leaves of a tree in the forest. You cannot know if you are in the same kind of a outer sanctuary or you are now in a building in which these monks are moving. When they want to eat food or serve, their long sleeves they have, they hold up like this and they pass like this. As if it is so natural, they don't make any noise. And I would sit quietly with them. I dare not move my feet lest it disturbs their peace. The only words I could hear in those Buddhist monasteries with a very nice hum, humming tone. Mm -hmm. And then some of their mantras being read. Om Padme Hane Om, Om Padme Hane Om. So that kind of repetition itself was creating a musical note in which they sat in meditation with their faces lit up with enlightenment and joy. I saw a real monastery. So this is exactly what people are looking for. In the West, people are looking for this kind of peaceful sanctuary. They don't have it. And I tried to go back to those sanctuaries and I find police guards standing there now. Different governments have got into them. Red tape, bureaucracy has destroyed the peace of the sanctuary. Made it into an inventory on the property list of the government. Things have changed so much. I wonder in which direction are we moving? Where are those sanctuaries left? You go to any monastery today, you find there is no peace. What are those monks discussing now? Whether the other monk should attend the next elections or not, should compete for the next election. Some are debating hotly if we should have democracy in the monastery and the next senior monk should be elected and not appointed. Why should one monk just be picked up by the senior monk and made into a senior monk? Why shouldn't we vote? Aren't we all equal? Now when you shout like this in a monastery, you don't experience the peace that used to be experienced in these monasteries. Where are those sanctuaries gone? I don't see any sanctuary left. If there are still some sanctuaries where you get that peace, I'd like to visit them and renew my experiences of peace and tranquility and joy and bliss. Wherever the civilized man and the educated man has stepped in, he has destroyed the peace of the simple sanctuary. We have brought so much argument, so much logic and philosophy into the peace. We want to question, how can you have peace? They said, leave us alone. We have peace. No, explain to us, how do you get peace? We must analyze it. And the few places on this planet Earth where one could go and get some peace are being deprived of that peace because of our curiosity, anxiety, our analysis, our mind, our mental games, we won't let them live in peace and we won't live in peace. Where do we turn to now? I think this present title of today's talk gives an answer. The inner sanctuary. Let's now find a sanctuary which we do not have to discover by going anywhere. 
Let's not travel to down south Florida or up in the mountains of the Himalayas in India or Tibet. Let's find a sanctuary which is as peaceful, as comfortable, as blissful as the sanctuary which we could see in those places, in the mountains. That sanctuary can be found within oneself. The inner sanctuary is perhaps the most peaceful, the most blissful, the most joyous sanctuaries of all. If anybody has had an entry into the inner sanctuary, even once, that person can vouch for the statement I am making. The joy and bliss of the inner sanctuary is more than the joy and bliss of all the outside sanctuaries put together. Therefore, here we have an answer that if we find the inner sanctuary, we are able to get the peace and joy which we have lost in these ashrams and deras and caves and cuevos outside in this world. What we have lost in the nice deer parks where Buddha could go and sit in meditation. Have you seen that deer park? It's still there in Sarnath, in Bihar, in India. Go and see the park where Buddha sat in meditation. See the tree under which he got enlightenment. It's still there. They are preserving the tree. They are preserving the park. It's full of holiday makers throwing empty packets of chocolates, cones, half-eaten ice cream cones. They melted before they could finish them because of the hot sun. All kinds of glassware, paper cups littered and people screaming and running all over. Not only children, even the older ones. Is it the same deer park in which the Buddha meditated and came to enlightenment? It's no longer the same deer park. The Japanese have come in and they said, you Indians lost a great heritage. You lost the teachings of the Buddha. You lost the peace and tranquility that could come if you had sat in solitude, sat in silent meditation within yourself. You destroyed the very places where Buddha sat and gave a hint. If you sit quietly like this, you can realize the light and the joy of the inner sanctuary. You didn't allow that place to grow. The Japanese said, we have more yens than you have rupees. We'll build one for you. Because we still have Buddhism strong in our country. Buddha still lives strong in Japan. You destroyed him in India where he was born. We'll come up and help you. They put millions of dollars into a project where one could now ride an elevator into the sanctuary. You can go in an elevator and that elevator goes up and goes slanting and takes you straight in a few minutes ride into the sanctuary. The sanctuary is a beautiful dome, lovely golden dome. And you can sit inside and have the peace away from the madding crowd, away from all the people who are trying to litter the park. You can go into that and sit. The Japanese spent a lot of money and time and sent the Japanese monks to create the atmosphere. I saw that monastery, that little sanctuary when it was being built. Looked such a splendid idea. And I saw it recently again after it has been completed and is now being used. There are so many cameramen from all over the world. CNN, everybody is reporting what's happening. Politicians are entering there, taking their pictures to show they also believe in religion. And nobody is sitting inside for meditation, for peace and bliss. Is this our understanding of a sanctuary? What are we left with? We are left with nothing but the real inner sanctuary inside our own head. This is the only dome left in which we can enter and prevent the photographers from getting in. This is the only dome left in which we can sit quietly and not let the media get in. This is the dome which can serve as the inner sanctuary. And we carry this inner sanctuary with us wherever we go. We don't have to go anywhere, travel anywhere. We have to stop traveling and we'll go into our own sanctuary. If we travel, then we are so engrossed in our traveling arrangements, we don't visit the sanctuary. If we stop traveling, stop moving, stop going, just sit anywhere we can and put our attention within this dome, we have entered the inner sanctuary. We don't like this dome. I used to think people love their bodies. I have a question mark on that now. People love the outer surface of their bodies. They don't love their bodies. I used to say, that man is so swollen-headed. He thinks so much about his own head. Now I am doubtful if I was right. Even swollen-headed people don't get into their head at all. They try to get into other people's head. 
There is nobody I find who finds peace, joy and beauty in getting into his own head, in his own body. Why is that? Here is a sanctuary you can enter at no cost. Here is a sanctuary you can enter at any time without wasting any time in travel. Here is a sanctuary you carry with you wherever you go. What could be simpler and easier than entering the inner sanctuary in your own head? Why don't we enter? Because when we close our eyes and try to enter, it's terribly dark in there. It's so gloomy and dark inside this head, we like to jump out and see the colorful lights of this world. At least the domes that these people make are beautifully decorated. They have tinted glass. The paintings are there on the tinted glass. The windows are beautiful. The light, subdued light, is so beautifully thrown in. And there's music of an ex excellent kind. There's music and light and color in these outside domes and sanctuaries. When we close our eyes and try to go into our own sanctuary in our own head, we see nothing except darkness. Why should we go into this sanctuary which is so boring, so full of darkness? And that is where we turn ourselves away from the inner sanctuary. We have been turning ourselves away from this inner sanctuary for ages. Throughout our existing life, even past lives, the whole of civilization, if you look at the history of man, has been trying to find sanctuary outside and ignored this dark sanctuary which one can enter by closing one's eyes. There is a little catch in this story. The catch is, the inner sanctuary is more brightly lit up than those outer sanctuaries. The catch is, the inner sanctuary has more beautiful, melodious, lovely sound and music than the outer sanctuaries. The catch is, you can see more colors in their original original form, flowing like a waterfall, colors issuing like fountains, not water colored by what, uh, lights, but color itself flowing like a fountain, which you can see is flowing right now in the inner sanctuary. All these things I am talking of, excellent lighting, excellent color, excellent drama going on, all this beauty that we were thinking has been placed in outer sanctuaries is actually placed in this sanctuary. The outer ones are a copy of this dome. They copied the sights and sounds that were seen and experienced by the same monks. And they just put an outside copy to remind us. This is what you can possibly find if you go into your inner sanctuary. After we listen to somebody talking so, so exaggeratedly about these beauties inside, we say, let's give another chance. Let's close our eyes and go in. We close our eyes, it's all dark. How come we close our eyes, it's dark, and where are those lights? Where is that music? Where is that beauty? In what part of the head is it lying? We close our eyes and we don't see it. Are we making some mistake somewhere? How come we can't go into our head and see the things that people speak of, and the saints and mystics and masters and yogis, and rishis and maharishis? All of them have mentioned about the light and sound within. They have described the beauty of the third eye center behind these eyes. That if thy eye be single, thy whole body shall be filled with light. Not only the head. Where is that light? And where is that single eye? How come when we close our eyes and go to the back of the eye and go into the single eye, we see darkness still? Where are we going wrong? We have to turn to these very masters who say that we have seen the light. Okay, master, if you saw the light, how come we don't? What did you do extra that we don't do, that you could see the light? The master say, there was nothing extra we did. All we did was to see inside. All that you do is to see outside. He said, no, but we close our eyes. They say, so what? Closing eyes doesn't mean that you look inside. If you are looking outside, you close your eyes, you are still looking outside. By closing your eyes, you shut off the vision of what is outside. So it's dark. Closing the eyes doesn't mean you've gone into the head. Closing the eyes means that what you could see outside, you're not seeing because the eyelids are in front of you. You covered up the pupils of your eyes with your eyelids. How can you see? But master, how can we see inside? Isn't that the only way to close eyes, not see outside? Then the masters explain us the key to seeing 
which is eventually the key to any sensory experience. The key to seeing is, we only see that where our attention is flowing. You draw on a blackboard a number of small symbols and one is a cross, one is a square, one is a circle, draw a large number of mathematical symbols or forms. Then look at one which you want to see. The others get blurred. They are not getting blurred, they are the same. They are as clear as ever. You are seeing them blurred, you are seeing one clearly. Why? Because your attention is going only on one and is being pulled out, withdrawn from the rest. You see one thing clearly and not the rest because of the flow of your attention to that thing. You are seeing it connected with your attention. Same way are the sensory perceptions. Who do you listen to? You go to an orchestra, the band playing with a number of musical instruments. The drums are playing and then the violin is playing and then the piano is playing and a lot of other instruments are all assembled and playing together. And you say, I want to only listen to that one drum and put your ear on that drum and listen to that drum alone. The more you concentrate your attention on the drum, the weaker all the other organs of music become. They aren't playing slowly or softly for your sake. They are playing exactly as they were playing. You hear the drum louder, clearer than any other musical instrument. You shift from that to another musical instrument. That becomes clear and strong and loud and the others become weak. Nothing is happening in the orchestra. They are playing the same way. It's your attention that picks up one thing and whatever you pick up becomes the experience of hearing and listening. Your seeing, hearing, listening, all the perceptions that you have are dependent upon the attention you give to them. When we close our eyes, we are still giving our attention to all the rubbish and garbage that we have collected in our life outside in this world. How can we see what is in the sanctuary? All our current and past relationships, all our problems, all our little small memories of good times and bad times, all this is coming in front of us when we close our eyes. We are still seeing what we were seeing before we closed our eyes. We don't take our attention away. Our attention is as scattered as ever. Our attention is scattered to the point it is difficult even to see what is in front of us. With such scattered attention, how can we say we want to look within and see what is in the head, what is in the dome, inside the dome, what is inside the inner sanctuary. When all our attention is flowing out and we are doing everything possible to keep the attention scattered. We are doing nothing to hold the attention back into the head. We are trying to overcome our loneliness by trying to find company wherever we can. We feel frightened if we are all alone. We want to run and see somebody around. Ah, now we are satisfied. We try to throw the strings of attention in every direction and tie them up so we don't remain lonely and alone. We want to make ourselves comfortable by putting our attention permanently if possible attached to different things, our home, our money, our security, our friends, our relationships, our children, our parents, our grandparents. We are constantly tying ourselves up with these strands of attention and trying to tie them up. And then suddenly one day we hear a lecture that the inner sanctuary is inside, we close our eyes as if we are going to meditate. We say, wow, we can't see anything. It's all dark. Let's try and see something and we see our friends our home, our wallet, all the things we have tied ourselves up come up at that time. If you have lost something and you want to find, try meditation. All the things in the world which we have considered so important, to which we have tied up our attention, come up during meditation. When the attention is drawn to those things, how can it turn around and see what is behind the eyes inside? It's all a game of attention. Human attention is the only resource only underlined, second time. Human attention is the only resource you have to turn inwards and see the light within. You have no other resource. If the attention is flitting and scattered all around in this world, don't expect to see any light within. It's only when attention is pulled back into your own self. If you can reverse the flow of attention, look at attention, how it works. It's your own attention. I'm not talking of somebody else's. I am talking of your personal attention, personal attention in the mind, your mental attention emanating from your own mind, your own head. 
through the sensory perceptions, through thoughts, through memories. How does it work? It works, it flows to one thing, then another, then another. Sometimes it flows to two things at the same time and the intensity is less. It gets divided. Sometimes it flows to 20 things at the same time. Its intensity is further reduced. Very little bits of attention are trying to catch up with everything. The older we grow in this world, the more our attention gets scattered. Because there are so many more things to remember, so many more things to do, so many more things to be careful about, so many things to worry about, mostly worry about. All these are distractions from looking inside. All these require the human attention to flow in a single direction from within, from the third eye center, from behind the eyes, from the center of the brain, from below the brain, from the medulla oblongata and the brain between that portion from that place all the way out into the world. That's what we are doing all the time. And we close our eyes, it's dark because what was in front, lighted up, is no longer lighted. Do you know the amazing thing that you cannot see a single thing with these physical eyes outside if there was no light falling upon the things which you are trying to see. Did you know that? If all light were withdrawn, all forms of external illumination falling upon objects were withdrawn, these eyes are incapable of seeing anything outside. And this power of seeing which operates through these eyes, when operating without physical eyes, with eyes closed, can see everything, all the things, even with no external light on them. Ever tried this? Try some real yoga. Not merely standing on, on your head. No headstands can give you that kind of light. You want to see totally in the dark and all things bright up like infrared rays coming through you. If you want to see things separated by walls, thick walls, and you want to see them, you can see them with the power of seeing without the scattering of your attention. How do we get that power? It's very simple. The power is not bought from somewhere, not brought from somewhere, not given by anybody. It's already there. In each one of us that power exists. The power comes with consciousness, with life. Whoever is alive and conscious has the power built into it. It's not a gift from somebody. It's a gift from the Creator. It's a gift from God that we became conscious and therefore the power of seeing came within us. And that seeing is not dependent upon the light outside. That seeing comes because the things that are seen, the creativity of the things that are seen, it self-illumines them. People who have withdrawn their attention from the body in meditative process, those who have practiced the art of withdrawal of attention as opposed to scattering of attention. We all know how to scatter attention. Very few of us know how to withdraw attention. People go to meditation schools and I am surprised. I have visited some of them. And I have visited them teaching meditation for years. People have been working for 40 years on meditation and all they have done is shifting attention from one thing to another. That's not withdrawal. Focusing attention as if focusing attention is the same as withdrawal of attention. It is not. Focusing your attention flowing outwards is as much outwards as scattering your attention outside. The withdrawal of attention is totally different. The withdrawal of attention is pulling the attention back to the point from where it was coming out in the first place. Where is it coming out from? Not from somewhere else, from your own self. There is no other creator of attention but your own conscious self sitting right now in the head behind the eyes. Therefore, this power of attention, which is so vital for a spiritual journey within, without which nobody has ever performed a spiritual journey, that power of withdrawal of attention lies within you. When you withdraw the attention, forget about the things outside and withdraw and see where is it coming from, who are you? To discover your own self, self-realization by withdrawing to the self gives you the power that I am talking about. That vision to see things in the dark comes immediately. If you are there, you will get the vision instantaneously. The moment the whole of your attention is gathered back to your own self, behind the eyes, you rise to a new creation, a new level of experience, a new world as it were, a new 
region of experience, a new level of consciousness. You reach that, where things are so different than here. What is the difference? If you withdraw your attention and see without opening these eyes, but with the eyes which are already opened inside, which are operating spiritually, what do you see? You see the whole of this world. You see all the worlds that have existed. And you see them with the light of their own objects. Every object in that world, of which this gross world is just a reflection, every object is illuminated by itself. Every person you meet has its own light flowing from the body. Every astral body is shining with its own light. Every astral tree is shining with its own light. Every astral animal, the elephants are flying in the sky, lighting up like clouds with their own light. Every experience in the astral stage is an experience based upon the light of that experience. No external sun or moon is required to light up those things. And who can see all this? Any one of you, any one of us. We are all qualified to see. How are we qualified? Because we are human and conscious. The only qualifications required are we should be human and conscious. If we are that, we are qualified. The process is withdraw your attention. Don't flow it outside. Withdraw your attention to the inner sanctuary behind the eyes. That light comes up and you see the new world. It's not new. In the beginning it looks new. People who start having that experience, sudden visions of that kind of things lighted up. Trees throwing their own light like Christmas parties happening all year long. Stars shining. They don't understand that meditation can give them such strange feelings of light and lighted up objects and lighted up things. In the beginning it looks so new. As they withdraw and go into a steady state of living, a steady state of living in the astral region, they suddenly get the knowledge. They, re they realize they were there before. You will realize it too. That this is no new place you have come to. This was the place to which you belonged. That you were there way much earlier than you ever came into the physical body from where you started this experiment. That this kind of meditation which involves the withdrawal of attention takes you back to a place which belongs to you where you were prior to being born here. And then you can recognize all the things which were there before you were born. Nobody tells you this is your place. You don't believe anybody else. Nobody has to tell you have faith in this. Put blind belief in this. You see yourself. You tell others I found it. They say he's crazy. You don't care because you've seen it yourself. That kind of experience carries its own proof with it. When you go to a place and remember you are there, there is no proof like that. It's the kind of proof you get when you wake up in the morning. When you wake up in the morning, nobody, you have never asked. I have never seen anybody in the morning asking somebody, please tell me, am I awake? I want proof that I have woken up. I have never seen anybody. Nor have I seen people really waking up and pinching themselves to see, is this the body in which I went to sleep? They don't do anything. I see that people don't even open their eyes and they know they are awake. What makes people awake is not the wakeful experience, but the memory of having gone to sleep. It's the memory that we did go to sleep. The eyes are still closed. You're still lying in bed. You recall it's the same bed. The feeling it's the same bed in which I went to sleep last night tells you you are awake. Wakefulness is not created by new experience. Wakefulness is created by the experience of knowing you went to sleep. That's what happens in the true steady state of being in the astral region. You discover that that world is not a new world that some great yogi came and told us about. That world was our world. We were there before. We descended into a gross experience of the physical world. If one can go really into that sanctuary of the astral world totally by withdrawing our attention, forgetting this physical body, Forgetting this physical world. It's a great sanctuary. Especially for the women. There's no weight there. No weight loss is necessary. You can be fat or you can be thin. You are weightless. You can fly whatever kind of astral body you have. There is no problem of eating. You can eat as much as you like without indigestion, without disease, without having to then do exercise to wear the fat off. I'm just giving you a few things. There, I could give you a long list. You could fly where you like. Nobody can deceive you. 
in the astral plane because you can't keep a secret, because you can read everybody's thoughts. I'm not talking of I par Brahm or such kind or a true home. I'm talking of the very first stage. The very first stage of realization. The very first stage of a true inner sanctuary that exists inside each one of us and can be attained by mere withdrawal of attention from this physical world. It's full of light. You don't need any torches. You don't need any, uh, any electric lamps. They don't fuse anymore. You got the benefits. Homes are hanging up in the air. You can fly into any home you like. It's lighted up. You can see it from a distance. Your names are written in illuminated signs. You can see from a long distance. It's a different life. And yet it is a real world. It's not a fantasy. I'm not talking of fantasy. If it were fantasy, we would come back here and think, boy, that was a great dream I had. We don't get that feeling. We see that, we know what is there. When we come back here, if we retain memory of that, we say, boy, how quickly can I finish my job here and go? There is no fear of death left after a single experience. A single experience like that removes the fear of death. A little longer appearance, a longer experience of that state removes fear, period. Not fear of death. All fears, period. Here, what could be a better sanctuary? Everybody is singing and dancing with joy. There is a very beautiful library there. You go and have a look at that library. It's very different from your library here. Here when you want to go and study a subject, somebody says, I am interested in biochemistry. And I want to go to the library and look into the science, science section and go into biochemistry. And I see the different volumes. The work done by previous scientists is placed in these libraries in the form of books or tapes. And you pull them out, you read them, you play them, you get knowledge of biochemistry. In the astral plane, there's a library. Any one of you can visit. There are volumes of all the knowledge that you want to seek written down. You pull this volume of knowledge and you get all the knowledge directly like a kaleidoscope of all the work done by any scientist on this planet Earth ever. What kind of library is that? You don't read it. You don't read books. Those books transmit knowledge to you. They're not like books. I'm just giving an example that you have and then you find scientists who were part scientists and part mystics. Do you know how many scientists were part mystics? Do you know how many artists were part mystics and saints? A saint is not one who puts on particular robes or garments. A mystic is not one who dresses up in saffron orange color or puts up ash on his body. A mystic is one whose perception is mystical, who wants to see the source of all things. And some of these great scientists and great artists have been great mystics. You don't want to, you don't want to believe my word? Don't. Go there and see because they are working there. Go and see they are working there. In the beauty of that inner sanctuary, they are doing the same work they were doing here and they are doing it much faster because of the resources available there. The astral world is a remarkable sanctuary. The greatest beauty of it all is that we don't have to die here in order to go to that sanctuary. Many of them died in the physical bodies. We buried them, we cremated them, we finished the body, they are rotting. The physical bodies are rotting and they are having a good time up in the sanctuary. And we don't know about it. They didn't come back to tell us. But there are these saints and mystics, living masters, perfect living masters, PLM for short. <laughs> these PLMs, these perfect living masters, who are alive and kicking in this world, they are going to those sanctuaries and coming back and walking about in this physical body even now. The best is to get hold of one of these and catch his hand. Get this information from one who is going and coming and can tell us something about it. Why wait for spiritual seances to hear from the dead? Why not hear from one who can die and come back and be alive and tell us the story? Why not go to one who knows how to die while living? In fact, if you want to be a real meditator, you want to have real spiritual experience, you must learn how to die while living. Nobody has gone to this sanctuary without learning how to die while living. And nobody who hasn't gone into this region, into this state of 
being dead and yet alive in the physical body can truly understand what Paul meant when he said, I die daily. They don't understand it, nor can they understand what it is to be reborn. Only those who have had that experience can understand what these things mean. Go and have it yourself. This is not something to believe somebody. The biggest thing I saw about these living masters was they did not set up a cult. They did not set up their philosophy. They did not set up a shrine. They did not set up a particular piece of stone and made us worship that. Unlike all the other religions which made us run after stones and, and our man-made domes and man-made churches and temples. These perfect living masters told us there is only one real church, only one real temple, only one real sanctuary, only one real shrine and you carry it with you all the time, just a human body. The only dome in which you can get the light is the dome of your own head. Go with it. They never brought us outside. We tried to make them go outside. We would run to masters and say, Master, which is the holy land we can visit? They said, holy land is behind your eyes, child. No master, but you walked here. This must be the holy land. We run after the physical, even ignoring the very words of the masters who are standing on the physical land. To so bring it back, this is the object. You can see, attention starts from you. Nowhere else. Start from within you. Go through the eyes because you, it is a visual experience. Go through the ears if it is an ordinary audio experience. As a visual experience, it is going from inside. From the same spot as the audio experience is going. From the same spot as the experience of touch is going. From the same spot the experience of smelling is going. Or any other sense. All sense perceptions are being generated from the same spot in the head behind the eyes. Do you see that going? Can you clearly see it? Not visually, but in terms of the process. Can you see the process of your attention flowing? If you can see the attention flowing clearly, then you know this is what is to be tackled. The attention flowing. Can you stop it and throw it back? Let it go all the way in. If you can, you got into the sanctuary. What could be simpler than that? It's the withdrawal of attention. Experience tells us when we want to withdraw attention, all the other scattered attachments that we have, they start pulling us out. If there was only one thing we were seeing, we could cut it out and bring it back. We are mentally trying to see hundreds of things at the same time. All the attachments we have created, all the memories we have created, they all come back one after the other and they don't let us go with them. Then our sanctuary can be attained by reversal of the direction of flow of attention. Nothing could be simple. And that sanctuary is so beautiful. That sanctuary gives you flight, locomotion, gives you immediate access to anything. You can move at the speed of light. The higher you go into the sanctuary, in the second region of the sanctuary, you can move at the speed of thought, which is unfathomable by our measurement. We do not know what the speed of thought we think thought is instantaneous. It's not. The speed of thought is much faster than the speed of light. The astral region gives you these facilities. And you can have that experience and see the beautiful architecture designs which will be created on planet Earth in the year 2020. You can see them now. You can see the music that will be played a thousand years hence. You can see the technology that will be available to this Earth planet, to the scientists, 100 years, 200 years, 1000 years, 2000 years hence. What kind of sanctuary is that? Where you not only get peace, joy, you get knowledge. A sanctuary giving you peace, joy, happiness, worry-free existence. A totally worry-free existence and then you can get all the knowledge that you want. That inner sanctuary has been placed in our own bodies, in the physical bodies. It has been trapped along with us. You know, there is a great prison, there is a great cage. Cage, you know where you trap a bird. I saw the bird trapped in a cage and the bird flutters and tries to get out, but cannot. So we put a little bird feed in and the bird eats the feed and thinks the cage is a beautiful home. That's what happened to us. We are trapped in this physical cage and we think this is it. And in this cage is trapped our astral self. In this cage is trapped our causal self. In this cage is trapped our soul. In this cage is trapped our creator. In this cage we have trapped everything. In this cage, we have trapped all the happiness that is possible. And we trapped it and we don't experience it. What a strange irony. 
irony of ironies, if I may put it like that. What a strange irony that the soul, the individualized form of the ultimate, ultimate total spirit, the ultimate unit of consciousness, the soul of a human being is sitting inside this little trap, this little cage. And the object of its pursuit, its beloved, its ultimate destination, the creator, God himself, is also trapped there. They are both trapped together in the same place. So close and they don't see each other. At least the individuated soul doesn't see the creator. He's so tightly trapped inside and is willing to look everywhere else except where God exists. This is the only temple of the living God that exists. There is no other temple in which any living God exists. And we don't look inside this temple. We are willing to go to any temple anywhere else. What great irony and tragedy there could be. There is a greater spiritual tragedy that is taking place. That the real temple in which we could find the creator, we are ignoring. Why? Because we do not know how to reverse the flow of attention. We do not know how to go within. That's why we are doing all this. If God is within us, so close to us, if the soul is within us, if our real self, immortal self is within us, the immortal creator is within us, why do we have to ask anybody else to help us? Why should we go to a perfect living master? Why should we go to anybody? The whole problem is all in our own head. The seeker and the sought both are in this head. Why do we have to go anywhere else? We have to go anywhere else for the simple reason that the seeker and the sought have been here inside us for millions and billions of years. We never met. What good is it being so close? What good is it being so close and not knowing how to meet? So what do we do? Who is interested in meeting the creator? I have sometimes pondered over this question for long. Why the seeking? Why should there be seeking? Why should there be a seeker? Who is seeking who? How many are there? What is the metaphysical truth of the reality of consciousness? I read the books, it's written there, but the mind cannot absorb it. Because the books say, there is only one reality. You can call that reality the creator. You can call it total consciousness. Nothing else exists but that reality. What about the rest of us? We are all excluded? No, we are part of that reality. We are an illusion, an experience, a generated illusory shadow experience of that one reality. That God, the creator, is the only reality. Therefore, when we talk of a seeker as a human being trying to meet God, we are talking at two different levels altogether. That is why it doesn't match. Because of these two levels of consciousness, we have all the contradictions. We read the books, they are contradictory. We go into our own experiences, they are contradictory. What is creating the contradiction? Have you ever tried to see this? Examine that all the contradictions in us are being, are being created because we do not differentiate between different levels of consciousness. When we reach the level of consciousness of the creator, there is nothing else but the creator. When we reach the level down to the level of a human seeker, there is nothing else but the seeker and the concept of a creator. When do these two meet? When the seeker, by self-realization, by going into the absolute inner part of the sanctuary, discovers there was no difference between the seeker and the sought, except the sought was real. The seeker was the illusion. This is a strange kind of game, that there is only one player, and the one player has to create the many. And by putting 20 mirrors, you become 20. And putting curved and different shaped mirrors, you become 20 different ones. And by making moving mirror, you move differently. What a game. It's a game of illusion. It's a game of maya. It's a game of a grand illusion. Where the images, the shadows look more real than the creator. And you start looking for an abstract creator. While the very one who is looking is holding the creator within its own deep self. What a strange thing. How do we solve this riddle? These PLMs, these perfect living masters. They don't say, go and study in that monastery, go and study in that particular university, go and read these books. They don't say that, they go inside, go within. Go within your own inner sanctuary where all the answers lie. It's there you'll get all the answers. You'll meet the creator and the created. You'll discover that the creator was consciousness, was not a being like us. We are the shadows. The creator was consciousness. We became conscious because we are part of the creator. 
Otherwise, we wouldn't be conscious. That our consciousness looks like the many through a process called dreaming. Just like when we go to dream, we meet ten people, they all look like having separate consciousness. They all have different attitudes. They all have different faces. They all have different thoughts. They fight with you. They argue with you. They hit you sometimes in the dream. When you wake up, you discover it was your own single consciousness that created all of them. Only when you are awake do you discover the oneness of the dreamer. It is not necessary for 20 people to dream, to see them 20 in a single dream. Indeed, in one dream to see 20 people, you cannot have more than one dreamer. It can be only one dreamer who dreams of 20 and makes 20 real. And they remain real till the dreamer wakes up. Same situation here. The more we wake up, the more we discover that the consciousness of a single reality created the illusion of the many. And the many became so real because of the constant perseverance of that level of consciousness. The persistence of one level of consciousness makes that level real. This physical world is looking real to us because it is persistent in its reality. If we step out of it once in a while, like having a dream or a fantasy and we come back, it gets linked up immediately through memory with the previous experience of this world and the world again becomes real. The persistence of this experience is not only confined to the fact that there is a continuity of images that create this world, it is also any interruption is immediately matched by a memory of the previous experiences and this becomes real. The same thing is true of the astral region which is equally unreal. The same thing is true of the causal region which is equally unreal. The same thing is true of the spiritual heavens, which are equally unreal. The same thing too is true of all the real mansions, permanent mansions, which are equally unreal. The only reality is that single consciousness created those mansions. Single consciousness created the spiritual regions. The single consciousness created the causal region. The same single consciousness created the astral sanctuary. And the same single consciousness created this physical world. It's all one. They are separate gods governing these region is only one. There never have been two. There never will be two. I say dogmatically there is only one God, one creator. There never has been a split. Yet the same God is responsible for all our experiences. When do we get this kind of knowledge so clearly and so powerfully that we should become an experience for us? Only when we go with it. No amount of books, no amount of literature, no amount of lectures, no amount of workshops, no amount of visits to the church or the temple will ever give us that positive, definite, proven knowledge of the existence of one single creator as going within. So we have to go within. I described the little sanctuary. It's so beautiful. My own teacher described it to me to draw me in. Later on I found that even those things are unreal. Perhaps not as unreal as this world. So I asked the great master by telling us and telling our mind, there are such beautiful things inside, aren't you trying to bribe us? He said, yes. He was so blunt. He said, yes, the mind, the human mind, doesn't want anything but pleasurable variety of experience. You know, experience that should have a variety and should be pleasurable. You give mind experience of pleasure, it loves to follow it. You give it a little better, more pleasurable variety of experience, it leaves the first one and runs to the second one. And then the third, it's the nature of the mind. The mind has always been doing this. If you want to take your mind with you, a little bit of bribing of the beauty of the inner sanctuary, the music and the lovely melodies is necessary. Not that this is a, this is a misleading, misrepresenting statement about the inner sanctuary. It is a true statement. It is not a true statement about the fact that the inner experience is true. It's as untrue as this. The only truth is, there is one single consciousness in which the whole experience is taking place. That truth is difficult for the mind to grasp anyway. There is no way the mind can grasp that. Once uh, a lot of learned intellectuals, authors, attorneys, barristers, business executives, they came to the great master. They said, let's corner him today. He talks so strong and powerful, he, I think, he just overpowers us. We don't remember all our questions right when we are in, in his presence. He has a strong presence. Let's prepare in advance and go and accost him. So they prepared themselves and went to the great master. And they said, Master, 
we hear you telling all these people all these poor dumb driven sheep around you that oh those things are beyond the mind aren't you trying to put us down we people who use the mind and believe in the ultimate power of the mind we believe there is no knowledge that is beyond the comprehension of the mind and all the statements that you make are easily comprehensible we can comprehend them because we analyze them we understand them we understand the context these poor uneducated people who run to you like a flock of sheep they may not understand but here we are he is a double graduate in education he is a law graduate with the, has been called to the bar at templeton he is a man who went and spent 5 years at oxford in, in england he is a man who is educated so much they have grown in their comprehension because of their education and because of their refining of their mind and intellect master don't tell us those stories keep them for the multitude tell us something that the mind cannot comprehend master said yes there are some things the mind just cannot comprehend they, they said give us one example and he gave one example he said it is impossible for the mind to imagine that there is only a single god and that god is in each one of us in completeness totally each one of them each one of us has that god completely totally there is no way we can break him apart and yet we can any time see him in not in 10 people but in 200 when we like can you understand they looked at him like this they were not used to this how can the part be larger than the whole this was not logical when logic fails the mind fails when traditional logic and rationality fails the mind fails so the great master had the last laugh i had the later last laugh when i saw them wondering what to say the question is there is a limitation great master gave more examples to other groups for example he given he gave a very good example he said can the human mind perceive a time which has a beginning and the answer was no and he said yet there is time with a beginning actual time with a beginning time has been created when it was created it must have a beginning how can you create and not have a beginning and it has an end that creation has a dissolution therefore there can be an end of time some scientists have tried to hit against this einstein was i think one of the earliest who really hit against this problem of created time and a and the circuit of time which is in one circuit but he couldn't break the mental limitation he recognized that the mental limitation will preclude any visual or any any kind of comprehensible thing that the mind can hold showing that there is time and outside of time there is no time what was there we cannot fill anything else up without time and space when we use our mind we cannot create emptiness emptiness gets filled up automatically by time and space whether we like it or not can you create with your mind a concept of emptiness which has no time and no space time ticks whether we like it or not who makes the time tick in emptiness the mind you have an empty space it gets filled up with space who fills it up the mind it cannot do without it the mind cannot do anything whatsoever without using time space and the cause and effect linear relationship of the flow of events it's a limitation of mind and yet we want to grab all the spiritual goodies with this mind a limited mind the spiritual goodies can be grasped only with the spirit with the soul which is timeless and comes from a region beyond the causal beyond the mind therefore if you really want to have that experience of the inner sanctuary you must go within die while living learn like st paul said how to die daily if you can you will be visiting the sanctuary whenever you like don't have to travel to florida or tibet or the himalayas i would like to conclude with a little story back from the bird sanctuary from where i started there used to be a merchant in india he was an importer and exporter he used to import things from africa and used to take some silks and indian wares and sold them in africa he brought cashew from africa so he was dealing in this business and once a year he used to make a trip to africa from india during one of his trips he went through a parrot jungle in africa a forest filled with these beautiful animals these beautiful birds parakeets and so on so colorful he liked them he decided to grab one of them he bought a cage while in africa grabbed one of these birds 
put him in the cage and brought back to India. In course of time, he fed that parrot with green chilies and peppers and all kinds of things these parrots like, which I didn't know much till I heard the story. All the goodies that the parrots like, he fed them and the parrot was very happy. The parrot ate the goodies, sang, danced, drank and was very merry. After a year, when the merchant was going to make his next trip to Africa, he asked this parrot, Now, Mr. Parrot, I am going to your homeland from where I brought you. Do you have any message to send to your folks back home? And the parrot said, Of course. Tell them, I am enjoying myself in this cage. I eat, drink, dance, sing, and I am making merry in this cage of mine. The merchant said, Okay, I'll convey this message. And he went over to Africa. In due course, he went into that forest. And he saw a lot of parrots. So he called them around. Come on here, you parrots. You folks, come here. I have a message for you. So all the parrots gathered around him. And he said, you remember, last year, I took one bird from here, one parrot from here, in a cage, and took him back to India. That parrot has sent a message for you. The parrot says, I am enjoying myself in my cage. I eat, drink, dance, sing, and I am making merry. I am very happy. When he said that, one parrot sitting on the branch of a tree got tears in his eyes and fell down dead. The merchant was very horrified at this experience. He thought this parrot must be very close to the one I took with me, that he could not bear to hear his message. And he shed tears and died on the spot. Anyways, saddened by this event, he finished his business in Africa and came back to India. Returning home, he told the parrot in the cage, Look, parrot, I conveyed your message. I told them that you are enjoying yourself in your cage, eating, drinking, dancing, singing, merrily living. So when I conveyed this message, there was one parrot sitting on the branch of a tree who got tears in his eyes and he fell down dead. When the merchant said this, the parrot in his own cage got tears in his eyes and dropped down dead. He said, Oh, foolish merchant, if you knew they were so sentimental with each other, why should you have conveyed this message? Anyway, it was too late. So he opened the cage and threw the dead bird out. As soon as he did that, the bird fluttered its wings, got up and flew and sat on top of a wall. And the merchant looked at it and said, So you aren't dead after all? And the bird said, No, not only I am not dead, even that parrot in the jungle is not dead. That parrot in the jungle only sent a message to me through you. And the message was, if you want to get out of the cage, die while living. Thank you very much.